Okay, so one of the ways, and it's actually one that we're currently engaged in, by and large, or at least some areas are engaged in, is what's called social stigma. In other words, we don't hang out with or we publicly chastise or admonish and ostracize people who engage in misbehavior, right? And why does that work? Well, remember, they're getting all of the benefit. Now, remember, this is misbehavior, right? Um, so this would be for a negative spillover. We would, they're getting all of the benefit. And what we're trying to do with social stigma by ostracizing people or making fun of them is to increase their costs of engaging in the behavior. And so you've actually seen this. If you want some, some amusement, you can, you can go on YouTube and type in Italian mayors chastising or making fun of or yelling at their constituents. And you'll see these videos of these mayors recording videos saying, right, if you have a coronavirus party, we will show up with the police and flamethrowers or going out and yelling at people in the streets to go home. Basically, that's what we, right? That's one of the ways in which we deal with uh, negative spillovers. We also might have uh, I don't know what we, maybe we call it social esteem. That would be a way to deal with positive spillovers. In other words, we, right, we call, this is in effect what's also happening in New York and some other places where they are, people are hanging out signs saying, thank you, first responders for all you do. And, um, all of those things. What's happening is the first responders are bearing all of the costs of going out and taking care of people. Well, maybe not all the costs because maybe eventually they're going to get sick and take up a hospital bed, but they're bearing most of the cost and they are only getting part of the benefit. So we would expect too little of the behavior. We would start to expect people saying, you know what, maybe I'm going to stay home or maybe I won't work as hard. And now they that may not fully happen, but basically the social esteem piece, what in effect we are trying to do is push that private benefit back up towards the collective societal benefit. So stigma and esteem would be two ways or sort of they're basically the same different sides of the same coin here. That's one one thing. So we've already been talking about for most of the class, we can have property rights. That's another way. So if you think about when I go to the grocery store, no, I haven't, uh, but when I eventually go to the grocery store, there will be a huge benefit of there being food on the shelves, of other people taking their time and energy to provide me with lunch or dinner. And this is certainly the same case, right, with Grubhub or, or DoorDash or Uber Eats or all these delivery services or Domino's, right? I get a huge benefit from somebody being willing to cook and deliver food to my house. So I get a benefit of ordering that food. They bear all of the cost. If they don't get most of the benefit, then we're going to have too little food delivery. And so how do we deal with that? One of the ways we deal with that is say, look, you don't have a right to expect people to deliver this. You have to compensate them. You have to increase the amount you pay them until they say, yeah, I'm willing to do that. In effect, we, by establishing rules, we have made it so that I have to compensate them. I can't get the benefit of their actions unless I compensate them. And so again, that's really where we've been living most of the semester and where we've been talking most of the semester is that there's a set of rights in the background that is working to align the private and the collective incentives. Now we can mess with these rights in a way that turns any situation into a negative or a positive spillover. So, and this has happened historically. So if any of you end up taking macroeconomics with me, we will, we will end up talking about life expectancy in China in the 1950s, right? So if we're going longer here, 
life expectancy in China goes, right? It drops down and then pops back up. Basically, in the Great Leap Forward, what the Chinese government did was to abolish private property rights. There were property rights, they were collective property rights. And what that meant was, we work on a collective farm. Now, do we as a group get to keep all of our food? No, the, the state takes a lot of it. But let's just think about a collective farm. Maybe this is too far away for some of you. Maybe China is, right, the other side of the world. Let's think about Hutterites. So Hutterite communities on the Hutterite farms, they generally, I'm trying to think, I know Hutterites have communal property. I think they have communal property in pretty much everything uh, within, the, within the farm. And I'd have to, don't quote me on that. But basically what's happening, we have communal property rights. The issue of course then is if I choose to go out and work my butt off farming, what happens? I bear all of the costs of the behavior and other people within the commune get the value of the greater production. And so we would expect in that case to have too little hard work on the, on the farm. Now, Hutterite communities and Anabaptist communities um, and lar smaller social settings largely can address that through social stigma or social esteem. Now, it turns out that those communities have to stay fairly small. This doesn't work if we're going to do this across millions and billions of people, which is part of why the Italian mayors mocking people and yelling at them in the streets has not been terribly effective because it might work within a community of, usually communities, these things start to break down. Uh, anthropological research shows that it starts to break down at the point where we stop being able to recognize everybody on a face-to-face -face basis. So, this, which is part of why Hutterite communities, once they get to a certain size, and I'd have to look at their bylaws, once a community gets to a certain population, they actually all have to sh pack all of their belongings and they show up in the central meeting house and they draw lots and half the population has to leave their right they get a certain portion of the property at that right or a certain amount of cash and they have to go leave and start a new community why because basically if that didn't happen communities that didn't do that eventually become too large for communal property rights to align private and social incentives so Again, if we are willing to have a small community where we have limited gains from specialization and trade, social stigma and social esteem may be an effective way. But we probably, if we want to be prosperous and flourish like we have seen society and human beings flourish for the last 200 years. We're going to need some way of getting people who don't know each other. Remember those millions and billions of people who don't have time and place specific information about each other to coordinate their behavior. And so we have to think about the rules that we can put in place. Now, remember, we could turn any situation into a what we would call a tragedy of the commons where people use too much or don't produce enough by changing the property rights. And that's really what happened in China. Unlike the Hutterite community, you take the entire agricultural sector of the large, massive country of China, and you do away with private property rights, and you turn all property communal. What happens? Well, people aren't going to work their butts off. They're going to try and skate by. Why? Not because they're evil people, but because the benefit of working their butt off, they go, I'm not getting anything out of this. Why would I work really hard? and right, incur all this cost, give up time spent drinking tea or sleeping in or spending time with my family, why would I do that if I don't get much of the benefit? And that's why basically around 20, somewhere between 25 and 35 million people in the country of China starve to death. 25 to 35 million people starve to death. This is more than, I think the estimates are that this is more than the number of people that, certainly it's, it's about three times, at least three times the number of people that were killed in the Holocaust in World War II. And it's about at least twice the number of people that Stalin killed in his gulags. This is massive. And it wasn't done by slaughtering people. It was done by changing the rules so that people no longer got the benefit that redounded to others. 
So again, social stigma, social esteem, property. But again, these are only going to work in limited small group settings. We should pay attention to them. They're important, right? This is why if you're in a job and your colleagues are goofing off and not doing a very good job or not following through, it's probably important to ostracize them. Why? Because otherwise the company is almost certainly going to collapse because people aren't doing their job effectively. But again, once we get out to larger societal levels, we're almost certainly going to need some property rights here. Now, sometimes at the higher level, maybe it's, um, maybe it's too costly to have private property rights or individual, what we think of currently as property rights. Maybe it's hard. Transaction costs are really high. And so in that case, maybe we would want to use what we would call quasi rights or quasi markets. And I'll explain what I mean by this here in a moment. Again, we don't want to neglect these other two. So in order to get maybe make some sense out of that, let me see here about setting up an example. So. Um, let me see, what can we do here? Let's think about a situation where we have a lot of air pollution. We have three factories, or maybe it's water pollution, I'll just call it yuck, okay? So we have factory A, factory B, and factory C. So we have these three factories, and again, I may run out of room here, and the amount of yuck that they're producing here is, 15,000 units of yuck, 30,000 units of yuck, and 45,000 units of yuck. Now let's assume, and this is a big assumption, let's assume so that the total amount of yuck that is being produced currently is 90,000 units of yuck. So let's assume that we know somehow the optimal amount. And the question, of course, would be, how do you know what the optimal amount is? And that's really tricky. So roll with me here and just assume that we know that. And then we could maybe get into the weeds on how we might start to be able to figure out what the optimal amount is. So let's just say that we somehow know that the optimal amount of yuck is actually half of this. It's 45,000 units of yuck. Because of course, there's also benefits of this yuck. There's more production. There's more goods and services in circulation. There's a lot of benefit out of that. So we probably don't want to drive the yuck to zero. It's sort of like, I think I may have mentioned, I know how to stop after, after September 11th when uh, people were saying, look, we really need to, right? We need to make sure that this never happens again. And I said, no, we don't. I said, well, what do you mean? I said, look, I know how to stop all terrorist attacks using airplanes. I said, oh, really? Tell me, this would be great. And I said, yeah, just ban all airplanes. No more airplanes, no more air travel, no more air, tra uh, no more, well, that, that clearly would be a bad idea. Yeah, exactly. But that's what it would take to ensure that we have no terrorist attacks ever again using airplanes. And so obviously the optimal number of terrorist attacks using airplanes isn't zero. It's hopefully pretty low, but it's not zero. It's just like what I talked about earlier, I think, in one of my lectures was that the optimal amount of cheating in my class, as far as I'm concerned, from my point of view as a faculty member, isn't zero. Why? Because what it would take, the cost that we would impose on you guys and me of trying to get that to zero would outweigh the benefits. Now, it's that doesn't mean we should just let cheating go unchecked, but it means that the optimal amount isn't zero. The optimal number of deaths from COVID isn't zero because what it would take to get there would really be to lock everybody in their homes for three weeks and shoot anybody who goes outside. Now that's clearly a draconian and deeply troubling proposition. So in this situation, so I, my point here is that the optimal amount of pollution isn't zero. The optimal amount of yuck isn't zero. So let's think about different ways in which we could get to this optimal amount. Maybe I'll put this over here in another color so that this is the optimum. Now, I'm going to add in another piece here. 
and I'm going to add in a differential cost, unit cost of reducing the yuck. And I'm just going to say the unit cost here, the cost per unit is a dollar for factory A, two dollars for factory B, and three dollars for factory C. So now let's consider some options and some ways in which we could reduce the yuck. Well, one option would be to limit all factories to 15,000 units of yuck. And so in this case, factory A would reduce zero because they have a right to pollute 15,000 units. And so their total cost of reduction would be zero. Factory B is going to reduce their yuck by 15,000 units, in which case their cost is going to be $2 per unit times 15,000 is going to be $30,000. And here, Factory C is going to have to reduce their yuck production by 30,000 units of yuck, which 30,000 times 3 is 90,000, which means here we have $120,000. We got to our optimum. But that, that took $120,000. And those dollars, we don't care about those dollars, but we do care about the value that those dollars represent. So we have a cap of 15. The cost is 120000 So maybe I'll put this at a cap of 15000 and the cost is 120. I'm going to move this over here, factory A, factory B, and factory C. So what's another way? Well, we could force all of the factories to cut their yuck in half. And so in that case, factory A is going to have to reduce their emissions to 7,500, which is going to cost them 7,500, $1 per unit of yuck. Factory B is going to have to reduce their yuck production by 15,000 units. At $2 per unit, that would be 30,000 units of yuck. Factory C here is going to have to reduce their units of yuck by 22,500 units of yuck times $3 per unit, 67,500. And see if I can do the math right here. I think that ends up at 105,000. So if we have cut in half, the cost is 105,000. Hey, that's better. We got the same result at a smaller cost to society. So that's an improvement. And it also shows that different strategies are going to have different results. How about another option? We could force all to cut by 15,000, in which case, what's going to happen? Factory A is going to have to reduce all of the, reduce their yuck to zero, which is going to end up costing them 15,000. Factory B is going to end up, it's going to cost them 30,000. They're going to cut 15,000 units times $2. And factory C here, it's going to cost them they're going to reduce by 15 at a cost of 45,000. So now the total here is 90,000. Okay, so that's even better. And again, illustrates the fact that different strategies are going to achieve the same result at different costs. Let's think about what the cheapest way would be. Well, we need to reduce by 45,000. And so obviously we would want factory A to reduce all of its yuck, costing 15,000. And we would want factory B to reduce all of their yuck, costing 60,000. And so our best or least cost way, there might be some equity concerns, some issues about is this fair, but our lowest cost way is 75,000. Okay. So how could we do it in the lowest cost way? Well, it turns out if we had this information, well, one thing we could do is simply legally mandate the factories A and B close their doors or shut or 
they don't have to close their doors, but they have to mitigate all of their yuck production. Another way would be a tax, and a tax of $2.01. And, and so if we tax yuck per unit at $2.01, and one penny, so for every unit that you produce, you pay the government $2.01, and a penny, what's going to happen? A is going to clean up rather than pay the tax because they can do that at a lower cost. And we would, again, it would cost 15000 and they would reduce their pollution by 15000 Factory B is also going to clean up because $2 is cheaper than $2 and a penny. And so it's going to cost $60,000. It costs them $60,000. Factory C, on the other hand, is going to pay the tax. They're going to pay $90,000, $90,450. And they're probably going to be a little upset about that because they're right but this here is not actually a cost to society this is resources that are transferred from factory c to the treasury which means they are still available for us as a society to do something else with and so the true cost of the tax while well, there's right the true cost here is 75000 the transfer is $90,450 so that's one way. Another way to do it would be to assign property rights. So how about we assign every factories? We just say, look, now part of the issue with this is it requires that we know what the optimal tax is. Or alternately, it, it requires us to play around and continue to increase the price of their increase or decrease, play with the tax amount until we get the socially optimal amount of yuck. Another way would be, again, we can assign rights, although these are slightly different. This is why we call them quasi-rights. They're sort of rights. In other words, we could assign rights to every factory that they get to pollute 15,000 units of yuck. That's going to get us to the optimal, right? And then we just legally say, you got to get there. You got to get there. We don't care how you get there, but you got to get there. So factory A, of course, says, well, that's fine. I'm cool. I don't have to reduce anything, right? Factory B is going to say, well, we have to reduce by 15,000. So that's going to be, that's going to cost us 30,000. And factory C says, holy crap, we're going to have to reduce by 30,000 at $3 a pop is going to be, we're going to reduce by 90,000. And now we're at 100. Ah, oh, this is like our worst case scenario, isn't it? Except for one important difference. You can transfer your right. You can buy and sell these rights, just like anything else. Now, again, this is why we call it a quasi-right, because it's really a right to something that is kind of weird. It's a right to do something. So in this case, you can assign a right, but it's transferable. And so now, if you think about it, factory C says, wait, we are spending $90,000 reducing our yuck. Is there any way we could do this for less? And they look and they say, look, factory A hasn't reduced their yuck at all. They can go and talk to them. Again, this will require some, entrepreneur, some entrepreneurship, some having some vision or maybe some arbitrage, some middlemen who go out and figure out where the cost is the lowest and bring these people together. But it turns out that factory C is currently paying $3 per unit of yuck reduction. Factory A could reduce their yuck by a dollar. And so in other words, somewhere between a dollar and three dollars, there are gains to be had from trade. And it might be that factory A says, look, factory C, give us two dollars and ninety nine cents per unit of yuck and we will reduce our yuck. Factory C will say, yeah, that's right. The owner of factory C would say that's a good deal. I mean, it's better than three dollars. We're not saving a lot, but we're actually at least saving four hundred and fifty dollars. Cool. Right. Now, it also might be that, that factory C goes to factory A and the, or the owners of them, because the factory obviously doesn't choose because of point number two, all of economics and four points. So factory C might go to factory A and say, hey, could we pay you a dollar and a penny for every unit of yuck? Would you be willing to reduce your yuck by 15,000 units or 15,000 units in or if we paid you a dollar and a penny? And, Factory A would say, well, 
yeah, sure, right? Because they come out ahead, they get all of, it's not much, right? It's $150, but that's better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick. Now, so we don't actually know where they're going to settle, but we know that factory sees some, there's, there's definitely gains to be had from trade. And so we would actually expect firm C to pay firm A. Now remember the amount that they transfer is literally a transfer. That's not a concern for us as economists. What we care about is the time, energy, and resources that are given up engaging in the behavior. And so in this case, factory A would end up reducing their yuck, assuming some level of entrepreneurship. And so now we have 15,000. Factory C now says, oh crap, oops. So we are down now at 30,000 units of yuck, but we have to get to 15,000. Well, I guess we're gonna have to pay, right? We're gonna have to pay the remainder. And so that'll cost us 45,000 to get that other 15,000 reduction. And so now we are at 90,000. Well, again, that's better than this because people engage in this trade, but it's still not our best option. So maybe property rights aren't the answer. Stop for a moment and think about that. Well, is that true? Well, it turns out what's the least cost way for factory C to avoid reducing their units of yuck by an additional 15? Well, remember, factory B is still sitting here producing 15,000 units of yuck. They've reduced their yuck by 15,000, but they could reduce another 15,000 and it will cost them $2. So again, somewhere between $2 and $3, there will be gains to be had from trade between the two groups. And so factory C, they might have to pay $2.99, or they might only have to pay $2 and a penny, but the amount that they pay is a transfer. What's gonna happen, assuming rational individuals and a reasonably low transaction cost environment, is that factory B now is gonna reduce their yuck by 15,000 units because of their initial reduction, and then they're going to sell their right to pollute to factory C for some amount more than $2 per unit of yuck, and they will reduce their entire yuck, thus costing them 60,000. Firm C here will have transferred some significant resources to B and A, but will still be better off as a result of this transfer, and they will end up reducing their pollution by nothing, thus bringing us to a grand total of 75,000 units of yuck. And so that turns out to be a, right, we get the optimum. Now we have the question, which is better a tax or the property rights? Personally, I favor the property rights because it's a lot easier to say, look, What's the optimal number of units of yuck, assuming we know this? And what we could do is we can just basically divide up those rights equally, or we could give them all to one person. From the point of view of efficiency in terms of the reduction, it actually doesn't matter because we could also then, right, do the same thing where instead of assigning 15,000 units of yuck to everybody, we could assign 45,000 units of yuck to A at which point A is going to sell those rights on to people who value them more, just like in any other market. Of course, this is going to require courts. This is going to require some transaction cost reducing technologies because the whole reason why we needed to do this was because transaction costs were too high. In other words, in society, it was too costly to get all of the people who were affected by these factories together to negotiate with the factories to figure out what the social optimum was. And so we, we can't obviously solve a, a major transaction cost problem with something that has a similarly high level of transaction costs. So, but, but even just going from the millions of people necessary to coordinate down to three groups is going to dramatically reduce these transaction costs. So it turns out that again, clear and transparent rules and transferability. Transferability is key here. And so as an example of this, I can tell you, right, there's many issues when rights are not transferable. So I don't know if any of we haven't really talked in class about how many of you might be fishermen or women. 
But it turns out that historically, there was no ability to, if you had a water right. Uh, in Montana, we have a right of prior appropriation. Basically, if you don't use your water right and divert the water and use it, you lose it. And the next person downstream or in junior rights holder can take that water. Now, historically, that might have made some sense. But in the modern age, what that meant was that people would basically use all the water in the Gallatin and the Madison some years. And what that meant for people who like to fish was that there wasn't enough water to keep the stocks high enough. And so Trout Unlimited, a bunch of concerned uh, fishers said, you know, look, we, and they went to the rights holders and they said, can we buy your water right? We really value having a certain amount of water in the, in the Madison and the Gallatin. And the ranchers and farmers said, yeah, you guys are willing to pay a lot for this. We're, we'll be happy to sell, your, sell you the right. And so Trout Unlimited bought the right. And then they discovered there was no water in the Gallatin or the Madison. And they went to the court and said, look, people are using our right. And the court said, yeah, actually, you don't have a right to in-stream flows. Our, our current rule system doesn't, doesn't view that or doesn't countenance that. Now, they subsequently have been able to get those rights to be transferable and get rights to in-stream flows in the state. And that has clearly been a good thing because now it forces people who use water to take into account the impact on fishermen and women. Be why? Because if they don't take it into account, they are giving up the revenue they could have gotten from Trout Unlimited. And so now... That actually it doesn't mean that they're going to actually sell their rights to Trout Unlimited, but it says that if they don't pay attention to Trout Unlimited, there's a cost there. They're giving up the opportunity to get that revenue from Trout Unlimited. Now, in a slightly different example, federal lands have grazing permits. I alluded to some of those on BLM land that my family ended up selling, which is, again, an example of why you government can't give things away for free in the long run. Now, it turns out on a lot of federal land, if you have a grazing permit and you don't use it, the federal government can sell and state governments can sell that grazing permit to somebody else. You have a permit to graze. You have a right to graze. You don't have a right not to graze. You don't have a right to exclude other people. And so it turns out that some people really would like to have backcountry area in the mountains with no livestock on it. But they actually can't assert that right in the, in the current system. They can't buy up those rights. They could buy the grazing permits. And then the government says, look, we sold those grazing permits to somebody else too. You paid us for them, but we sold them to somebody else. Why? Because you weren't grazing anything. I would argue that we can definitely make ourselves better off if we made those rights transferable, not a right that you have to use or lose it, but rather a right to do something or not to do something. Okay, so oftentimes, hopefully this, this makes some sense. I hope that we'll have a chance to talk about this in chat or you will raise some questions if it doesn't make sense to you. But the key here is, again, that if I don't either, if I can't force you to compensate me, in one way or the other, it doesn't have to be money, but if I can't force you to compensate me for the benefit that my actions give to you, or if I can't force you to compensate me for the costs that you impose on me, then we would expect either too much or too little of a behavior, and that would be an argument for government stepping in. Now, I would say that oftentimes in the discussion about spillovers, the argument actually goes more not along the lines of there is too much of this behavior from a social perspective. We need to find some way of increasing the cost of the behavior or there's too little of the behavior. Usually what happens is the discussion boils down to your behavior has a negative impact on me. Therefore, government should keep you from doing it. Or alternately, your behavior has a positive impact on me, therefore government should make you do it or should at least subsidize you. But of course, neither of those are anything more than a juvenile or child's argument, basically throwing a tantrum in the aisle at the grocery store saying, I want mine. 
what is an analytic justification for government intervention is that there is either too much of the behavior from a societal point of view or too little of the behavior from a societal point of view. So part of the problem here is how do we know who is right? How do we know who's right? How do we know whether we should have more of the behavior or less of the behavior? This doesn't give us the answer, but it at least allows us to start having a meaningful discussion. So one of the things we've already talked about is, for example, higher education. And people say, look, higher education produces a large benefit for people. Yes. Faculty showing up and working their butts off trying to teach students effectively has a positive impact on students. Yes. So we should force government, right? we should have government subsidize it. Wait, why? What is the spillover that you get out of my behavior that you don't compensate me for or that I don't take into account? Well, if we had it so that everybody could go get a college degree and faculty weren't paid, then yeah, we would have, a, we would have way too few faculty. We wouldn't have nearly enough instructors. But in the current situation, what is the benefit that you get that you don't have to compensate for? Or maybe we, maybe we change the discussion and say, look, maybe you deciding to get educated has a societal spillover. And I say, well, what is that spillover? And people say, well, it makes students more productive. And I say, yeah, but can you exclude? So this is another, another question. Can you exclude people from the benefits of you being more productive? Well, yeah, if they don't pay you or compensate you adequately, you don't work for them. You go do something else. So the productivity side of education isn't a spillover, or at least not with our current rights. Now, again, we could reinstate slavery, at which point, yeah, then there would be a problem. And we would expect a, an under provision of education or of educated people. People would generally choose not to go get an education if other people can use their labor without their consent. So what's the spillover? It's not the productivity. In order for there to be an analytic case for government involvement, you would have to argue that there is some spillover out there that is not being taken into account. Either that there's too much of the behavior because you get a benefit out of getting educated and you don't bear all of the costs, or, right, in which case we would expect too much of the behavior, or alternately, you bear all the costs and only get part of the benefit, in which case we would expect too little of the behavior. The key here is we, it could go either way. We could have either too many people getting educated or too few people getting educated. I suspect, honestly, in our current environment that too many people go to college. Why? Because we subsidize it. So again, in order for that to make sense, remember that graph that we drew up with a subsidy for higher education? And there's a reason why I've, I've sort of insisted on that is because I think that's, that's a common example that people use to claim that we need government intervention. Bernie Sanders has been arguing we should make it free for everybody. And other people have been arguing that we should forgive student loans and so forth. Now, unless there is a spillover argument, a positive one that other people, neither faculty, because we're here in supply or administrators here in supply, nor the students, there's some benefit that people who are neither faculty nor students get that they don't have to compensate for. And this can't be the employers because you can exclude them. If that isn't the case, then we have too many people going to college. We have too much of the behavior. Again, if you think about this last unit of somebody going to college, this is the value we as a society give up. This is the value we get out of that extra degree. We have the cost exceeding the benefit on a societal level. But on a private level, if you pay this amount, then the costs are equal to the benefit. And so this is a case, again, where I would argue that unless there's a large positive spillover to you getting educated that redounds to other people who are neither employers, nor faculty, nor administrators, nor you, then we have too much of the behavior because of the subsidies and where what we should do would be to get rid of the subsidy and come back here. There would not be an argument for government intervention. On the other hand, if you think that there, if you can make a plausible argument that there is this large spillover, and that would be what I definitely buy that argument currently with the COVID-19 contagion is that 
we need government intervention because otherwise individuals aren't going to take into account the harm that their actions cause to other people. Say, look, I've been in my house now for three weeks. I haven't left. I went out and sat on my porch for a little bit, but that's really it. Took out the trash. Said, I've been bearing all of the costs of that. The benefits of that have redounded to other people if, now part of the way we've addressed that is through social stigma. And that's part of why I actually take these sorts of things quite seriously. So again, one of the things that we have to figure out is who is right? And we need some system for maybe determining that. And that's hard, that's not easy, but we should understand that as I talked about in the last lecture, that people are not going to be talking about the social benefit when they go and talk to legislators. What they're gonna be focused on is their benefit and their cost. So how do we know who's right? If we know who's right, then the question is, how do we do it? What's the lowest cost way to address either the negative or the positive spillover? As I mentioned already, one solution is to develop empathy, to develop compassion, to develop self-control. Well, I didn't mention that one. That's, that's one, right? Internalize this. That's part of why I've been staying at home. That's part of why I try and work quite hard at my job is because I understand that generally speaking, now that I'm on the other side of tenure, there are not formal rules in place that force me to take into account the benefits that redound to students from my working hard. And there's also no, nothing that forces me to take into account the benefits that redound to my colleagues from working hard because my working hard makes them their lives easier. And so if we, again, in higher education, can't use formal techniques, we're gonna to have to rely on either empathy and self-control or social stigma. Now, of course, if you're at a large university, like I think we're small enough that, that, that social stigma could probably work. I mean, it's, it, we're, at the, we're, at, we're about the limit of it because uh, we have, I don't know, was it 300 faculty, something like that? That's, that's the upper bound of where that starts to work. But at a place like Michigan State, no, you're going to need formal rules. So one, one way is to develop empathy, compassion, right? So one is empathy or an awareness of these issues, which is part of why I take these things far more seriously is because I understand this is an important one. We also have things like social stigma or esteem. And we could have, right, again, maybe some form of property rights or rework the property rights. This allows for cooperation, like what I mentioned with the Rainy Wildlife Preserve. Once the Audubon Society owned the land and were giving up the revenue from oil exploration, they took into account the impact of their decision on other people. Now, that doesn't mean that we know that they're going to permit oil pumping but it means we know that they at least are thinking about it. And if they say, no, we're not gonna allow oil pumping, they have weighed the costs and the benefits. We could spend a fair bit of time on this one. It's a really interesting topic. It's part of, I spend, or at least I have historically spent a fair bit of my summers over in Bozeman. Part of that's because that's where my parents are, but it turns out there's also a think tank looking at market solutions to environmental problems. Now, personally, I don't give too much of a, I don't care particularly about the environment. I care about the environment, but no more than I care about a lot of other things. Uh, some of the other people, a lot of the other people involved in the organization, one of their prime concerns is the environment. But I'm still interested in being there because what we oftentimes, what we spend our time looking at is how could we use property rights? How could we try and leverage markets as much as possible? Because markets are this really cool discovery process, right? They convey information and provide incentives to act on that information. So one of the doctrines was the common law doctrine of trespass and nuisance. So under British common law, historically, if your behavior crossed over onto my land, trespassed, and reduced the value of my property, nuisance, I could go to court and just get a blanket injunction. You had to stop. Now, that didn't mean you actually stopped. What that meant was you now had an incentive to come. We knew who the right hat holder was. And so now you had to come to me if you wanted to keep doing this and say, look, I know that my pumping these things into the water killed some of your cows. And I have to compensate you for that. 
but it turns out reducing the, the pollution is going to be really expensive for me. It's going to be really costly, not just expensive, but costly. What would it take for me to be able to buy out your cattle operation? Or how much would I have to reduce my pollution to get you to be okay with it? And how much would I have to pay you? Basically, trespass and nuisance, the legal